welcome to episode 34 of the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. My name is Taylor and I will be your host. This is a podcast primarily about knitting, though we do get up to other fiber related topics from time to time. I am coming to you from Henderson, Nevada, which is a small suburb outside of Las Vegas, Nevada in the American Southwest. This is where I am from and where I live with my husband, Brandon, our three and a half year old son, Angus, our seven month old son, Ronan, and our big fat house cat, Oscar. If you are a returning viewer and subscriber to the channel, thank you so much for coming back time and time again, every time I upload something new here at the Wool Needles Hands Fiber Journey channel. And if you are a new viewer and subscriber, thank you so much for checking out my little corner of YouTube. If you'd like to get in touch, you can do so via email. The email associated with the YouTube channel is woolneedleshands at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with me via snail mail now. You can find a PO box address in the about section of the channel. We have a Pinterest page for the Wool Needles Hands podcast. You can find that over at Pinterest. Search Wool Needles Hands a knitting podcast and you can find us that way. This is a kind of a visual way of sharing with you what I talk about here on the channel. It's more like visual show notes than anything else. So if you see something that you like here on the show and you want to be reminded of what it was, you can head over to the Pinterest page. Everything is linked directly there. As always, I want to thank Steffi, who is at Hootie Knits. She is our Pinterest moderator. So Steffi, thank you so much. The Pinterest page is looking fantastic. You can find me on Ravelry at Wool Needles Hands, and you can join the Ravelry group associated with the podcast by searching Wool Needles Hands in the Groups tab or Wool Needles Hands, a knitting podcast. Find the group over there, join. There's lots of fun things going on. I'll be talking about some of those things in just a moment, but definitely join over there to take part in the lively chatter. You can also find me on Instagram where I am most active. I have two Instagram accounts. I have one associated with my podcast and the knitting and all of that part of my life. And then I have another associated with my hand dyed yarn company, Fiber for the People. You can find me and all things related to my knitting and the podcast at Wool Needles Hands. You can find my hand dyed yarn company, Fiber for the People, at fiber.for.the.people. If you'd like to learn more about Fiber for the People, you can do that by heading over to the shop site, which is fiberforthepeople.com. When you head over there, you can learn about how I got started with the business, see what kinds of fun things are in store, look at my bases and the colorways that are offered. You can also sign up for the newsletter by scrolling all the way down to the bottom of the page, adding your email address into the subscribe box. That way you can be notified about all things Fiber for the People and Fiber for the People shop updates on a regular basis to keep you in the loop. There is a shop update coming for Fiber for the People on Saturday, October 27th, which is a week away from now. I'm giving myself a little bit more time right now and also between the next shop update and the one following that, I'll be allowing myself a little bit of extra time because I am working on advent calendars, which are definitely a lot of work as well as my yarn club. So all of that piled on top of my regular shop updates, piled on top of my really most important job of being a stay at home mother to my two boys. All of that means I need to add a little bit more time to my schedule. So the next shop update for Fiber for the People is October 27th. I'm super excited for this shop update. My previous shop update, I included solids and variegated colors, a tonal and a speckled colorway, and I really love the way that collection came together. So I'm going to be replaying that in the next shop update. So we're going to have a variety, some solids, a tonal, a couple speckled colorways, all perfect for coordinating and pairing. So definitely look for that in the next shop update. And now to give you a little bit of an idea of what is coming to to that shop update, I'm going to do what I like to call yarn sexies. Because I'm filming this quite in advance, I don't have the physical yarn to show you. So I'm going to show you some photos of colorways that I'm going to be offering in the shop update from previous updates, as well as some inspirational color palettes to let you know what kinds of color schemes you can be expecting in Saturday's shop update on the 27th. So without further ado, here are the yarn sexies. <laughs>
I think it's a really nice uh, fall palette, not quite so Halloween-y as we see this time, not that there's anything wrong with that oranginess of Halloween, as you can clearly see, I'm totally embracing that right now. But I wanted something more kind of earthy and neutral, but still fall. So I'm really, really excited about this. I think it's going to be just beautiful. If you shop the update on Saturday, don't forget to use the coupon code WNH for 10% off your entire order for being a viewer of the Wool Needles Hands podcast. Also, I just released a vlog series. It's actually the second uh, vlog series in the total vlog series that I'm doing right now for the Colorfest Sock Set Club for Fiber for the People. What it is, that kind of sounds confusing, but what it is is I am vlogging my process for coming up with the individual exclusive colorways for the Colorfest Sock Set Club that's going on right now. Listings for that club are closed, but I am documenting and vlogging my process for coming up with those individual colorways. So you can find the most recent vlog series in that collection on YouTube right now. It is a vlog 10. It is a five part series. Definitely, um, I definitely recommend that you go check it out. You can kind of see a little bit about my process and how I come up with these colorways for the sock set clubs. And it's just kind of a nice peek inside my dye studio. So definitely don't forget to check that out. I will go ahead and link to it right up here so you can click it and hold it in your taskbar and come back to it later. We have knit alongs going on over here at the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. The first knit along that we have going on is a year long knit along. It is called the Wool Needles Hands Year of Hats Cal 2018. It is where we knit a different hat every month of the year and they're all based on different themes or different techniques that are being used for those particular months. This month is knitting fingering weight hats for the month of October. You can learn all about the various different months in the Ravelry group, in the chatter thread, and in the guidelines thread that I have for that. I um, created a separate guidelines thread for the entire knit along and then I have separate chatter threads and FO threads for each of the different months. So you can definitely go and learn more about that over in the Ravelry group. But I want to share with you guys some of the hats that are coming out of the FO thread for the month of October. These are fingering weight hats and you guys I know um, knitting a fingering weight hat takes a little bit longer than um, knitting with DK or worsted weight yarn. But I am allowing you to hold those strands of yarn double. Whatever you want to do just use some fingering weight yarn. That's kind of my only criteria for that. Um, not a big stickler. I just love to see the beautiful things that you guys come up with. So here is a look at some of the finished objects coming out of the October FO thread for the Wool Needles Hands Year of Hats Cal 2018. <laughs> always beautiful, inspirational. I love seeing the work that you guys are doing. I want to take a minute to announce the prize for the October portion of the knit along because October is almost over and we need to have a prize. So what I'm going to be offering for October for the winner from the FO thread is a skein of yarn. I have lots of hand dyed yarn that was donated to the show to give away um, for prizes. So I'm really excited to be able to give this one away. Let me set this over here. This is a skein of yarn by Everyday Yarn Works. And that is etsy.com backslash shop backslash everyday yarn works. It is a beautiful skein of yarn. Here it is here, a beautiful yellow and gray with some gray speckles happening throughout their really, really lovely colorway. Absolutely gorgeous. This is the colorway Bloom Where You're Planted. It's on her ultimate sock base, which is an 80-20 superwash merino nylon. It's really gorgeous. I really love it. So this is Everyday Yarn Works. And this is the label. So you can see kind of her like logo. Really, really pretty. So the winner of the October portion of the knit along will be receiving this skein of yarn as well as a little package of stitch markers. This is a new little project bag and notions company that just popped up on Etsy. This is run by Lacey who is at Lacey Knits Daily on Instagram. And gosh, you guys, her things are beautiful. So I'm gonna show you this little package that I have here. I don't wanna open it um, because it's got her little um, sticker label on it, but this is also going to be coming with your yarn. And then 
in a second, I'm going to show you a project bag sample of what she offers in her shop. So here is the little package that's going to be coming with the yarn. She has her business card in here and I really want you to see how beautiful her business card is. Like just look at that. I know it's shiny because of the bag, but ugh, it is such a gorgeous business card and that little logo with the little cottage. Ugh, I love it so much. And then this is the sticker holding the little bag together. And inside you're going to be getting a little snow globe progress keeper type thing. It has little star glitter stars in there. And then what looks like a little felted pom-pom progress keeper there as well. Ugh so cute plus a couple little bags of tea as well as um of course the business card so this will be coming with the skein of yarn for the winner of the october portion of the knit along now i want to show you a project bag that lacy created and she sent it out to me um and i'm keeping it for myself because you guys it's gorgeous and it has little cactuses on it and i think it's perfect so I definitely wanted to hang on to this but I want to show you so you can see what kinds of project bags we're working with here at Little Robin Cottage they're beautiful so here is the project bag it has this really cool detachable arm strap here and then I have to show you her little um, logo tag because it's color it's in color it's not just you know stitched the name of her company it's actually in color and it's oh my gosh you guys I don't know if you can really see if it's blowing it out or not, but it is so adorable. It says Little Robin Cottage. Let's see. Oh, it's so cute. And then these little bag pulls, these are actually progress keepers as well. Um, it's the little leather, leather like, I don't know if it's actual leather, but it's like a tassel. Oh, with a little heart right there. Um, oh wait yeah actually the tassel can be taken off and used as a progress keeper I suppose and then this little heart is also a separate progress keeper as well so cool so this is and then of course this beautiful contrasting zipper love that and then the inside of the bag Ugh, look just look isn't that so cute Okay, so you guys definitely need to check out Little Robin Cottage. This is Lacey Knits Daily on Instagram. Such a quality bag, really sturdy. Um, it's lined beautifully. The sewing is just perfect. Love it so much. So definitely check out Little Robin Cottage, but I will be keeping this. However, the little bits and bobs that I showed you will be coming with that beautiful skein of Everyday Yarn Works yarn. I will be announcing the winner for October on the next episode of the podcast, episode 35, and that will be out the beginning of November. The next knit along that we have going on here at the channel is Wool Needles Hands Garland Along 2018. It is pretty simple. We are knitting or crocheting garlands for the holidays, for decorating our house, for parties that we might be having. It doesn't really matter what you're doing it for. We're just knitting or crocheting garlands I have yet to start mine and I really need to get going because it's somewhat time sensitive it's for my sister-in-law who's expecting a baby in November it's for the baby room so I need to get going on that I talked um, in a little bit more detail about what I'm going to be doing for that on the previous episode of the podcast so definitely check that out but moving forward I have that on my to-do list I definitely want to get at least half of that done by the next time I see you guys on the next episode of the podcast but that's on my to-do list I know you guys have already completed some really awesome garlands. I'm loving watching those coming into the FO thread. I'm going to go ahead and share those with you in just a second. But for those of you that have yet to join, you have plenty of time. This make along doesn't end until January 1st. So if you'd like to join us, definitely jump on board. Use the hashtag that I'm showing you at the bottom of the screen. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and look at some of the really pretty garlands that are popping up on the FO thread. Also, 
I just found a really beautiful autumn fall inspired garland. I'm going to pop it up here on the screen so you can see what it looks like. I don't know the name off the top of my head at the moment, but I'll pop that up on the screen as well. But this garland is gorgeous. So if you are looking for something to um, knit or crochet as a holiday decoration for Thanksgiving or for fall or for autumn, what have you. And you can also head over to the Ravelry group to get inspiration on some other garlands that people are suggesting over there as well. So today I am drinking my favorite go-to tea. Um, if you've been watching the podcast for any length of time, you know that my favorite go-to tea is Orange Spice by Bigelow. I have kind of my usual concoction for this tea. I usually double the tea bag and add a little bit of Splenda and I'm telling you the flavor of this tea, especially when you punch it up and make it a little bit stronger, just smacks of fall and autumn and everything cozy and toasty. I love it so much. And I'm actually drinking this in a mug that my mom brought by for me. Um, not sure where she got it, but it's a little Halloween inspired mug. But as I'm holding this up to show you and I'm looking on my screen over there, I'm wondering why coffee mug designers don't put the image on both sides of the coffee mug. When you're drinking, I mean, okay, if I were left-handed, then you would see what I'm looking at, but I'm not, I'm right-handed and it doesn't really matter. It should be, you know, the same on both sides so that the person on the other side of you can enjoy the funny little saying on the coffee mug just as much as you are. I don't know, I just think it's kind of weird that they don't do that. But anyway, my coffee mug says, I'm afraid the good witch is on vacation. I'm really not sure what she was suggesting by getting me this coffee mug, but it's adorable. And uh, yeah, so that is what I'm drinking right now in my super Halloweeny coffee mug with my super Halloweeny pumpkins in the background and this super Halloweeny fall color that I'm wearing right now. I'm realizing how I have embraced the fall color scheme here, um, but what can you do? I am so excited for my FO segment for today because I finished my Veronica Cardigan by Shannon Cook. You guys, I'm, as you have noticed, I am wearing it and I love it so much. I feel kind of awkward like showing it to you with it on my body. So in a moment, I'm going to take it off and talk about a few things. But you guys, if you have this in your queue or it's something that you've thought about knitting and you haven't yet, you need to cast on because it is number one, such a satisfying knit. But number two, I love this. It is I mean, the outfit I'm wearing right now, it's so comfortable. I have it on with this long sleeve shirt, a pair of black leggings, and then this, and it is so cozy. When I did my little FO photo shoot the other day, I was wearing it with a cute pair of like semi-high-waisted jeans, and it looks so cute. You guys, it just goes with everything, especially because it's in this really nice kind of deep gray color. I'm so happy with this. So let's talk a little bit about how I knit this. Now, I actually, did this on the suggested needle size. I didn't have to go up or down in needle size. Um, at least I didn't think I did when I started out. Now I did not knit a formal gauge swatch for this. This is something, all I did was I knit a little bit of the stitch pattern with the needles, with this yarn to see if it would get gauge or even close to it. Because the old me, that's how I did things, is I just kind of knit a little bit to see if I would, and I didn't even necessarily knit extra stitches to hold the portion of the swatch flat. I just knit the number of stitches in the gauge and kind of gave myself a couple of inches and then measured it out from there. I didn't even cast off or take it off the needle or anything. It was, you know, that's just how I did it. I figured it came close enough um, that I would be okay. So I didn't knit a formal gauge swatch with this, but based on the way my technique, it came out fine. Um, you know, it looked like I was going to get gauge. It looked like it was going to measure up. Well, when I finished knitting it and actually as I was working on it, I kept feeling like it was gonna be too small and not necessarily too small, meaning too tight because this has so much you know, positive ease added into the design, but almost too cropped. And, um, and when I would put it on, you know, I kind of would adjust it to see if that crop, if that was actually the way it was gonna be or if I was just wearing it wrong. And as I continued knitting, I kind of noticed that, okay, it's not gonna be as cropped as I thought. But after watching the most recent episode of the Hey Sister podcast and listening to Rachel talk about hers, um, she made a comment about how Shannon on her Instagram feed, so at so very Shannon, how she had posted a few posts back about kind of the way 
this wears depending on which size that you're knitting. So I knit the smallest size. This is a size one. Um, and she talked about how if based on your body measurements in the intended amount of ease, you would knit a size one, then you would probably want to knit a size two if you wanted it to fit like it fits on the model in the photos. That's what I gathered from her Instagram post. She says that um, she would have knit a size larger for a more drapey, cozy feel, and then she would knit her true to size for the actual amount of ease. It was kind of confusing, but when I saw her wearing it in the photo, and then I went through all of the people who had recently knit this on uh, Ravelry and looked at their FO photos, I started to figure, okay, even if it is coming out smaller dimension wise, it will still have plenty of positive ease and be super comfortable. And then also I had to take into consideration that Patton's classic wool worsted is a slightly lighter worsted weight yarn, especially if you're comparing it to Daughter by Yoth. Um, Yoth or Yarn on the House, uh, their worsted weight yarn Daughter is kind of in between like a a heavy DK and a worsted, but it even seems to me to be maybe loftier than this. And so I kind of figured that that might be working against me too as I was going. I would put it on, I would drape it over my shoulders and it seemed like it would be fine, especially after I blocked it. Um, now blocking will always kind of soften the knit fabric. Also the yarn is going to bloom, which is gonna help fill in some of the spaces in the fabric, also plumping that up a little bit. So I knew all of these things needed to be taken into consideration. So I took it out, I wet blocked it, I did everything that I needed to do. The only thing that the pattern calls for that I didn't do was I didn't use blocking wires. I've never used blocking wires before, but after reading her, um, kind of her rationale for using blocking wires, it made me curious. And so I ordered a set of blocking wires on Amazon. They're not very expensive, but I didn't end up using them for this. I just laid this out and weighted it down. I didn't even pin it. I, I pinning, um, you know, knitted fabric to block gives me the heebie jeebies. Cause I feel like it's gonna, you know, shrink in a little bit. And then you're going to get this like weird, you know, circus tent type thing going on on the edges. So I didn't, I didn't pin it. I just laid it out and then I weighted it down um, in the corners and along the edges and everything. And it blocked out really, really nicely, but it didn't block to the dimensions of the schematic. I was a couple of inches, I was like almost like two to three inches less than the schematic. And I'm not exactly sure why. I feel like my gauge couldn't have been off that much, but I know that they say, you know, a teeny, teeny, teeny difference in your gauge could mean inches in your final product. And I believe that. Um, and I didn't do an actual gauge swatch, so shame on me. And that might be why it didn't block to dimensions, also the yarn, whatever. Fortunately, it didn't matter because when I put it on, I seamed it together, I put it on, it fit like a dream, almost as if it was perfect for my size. So I'm so happy about it. But going forward, I'm not going to take the whole, you know, I'm just gonna start knitting and see what happens approach. I'm definitely gonna knit a gauge swatch just because I felt like that feeling that you get, like maybe it's not gonna come out right. And then also knowing that you didn't do your due diligence of knitting a gauge swatch. I just don't like the way that that feels. It makes me feel guilty. It makes me kind of feel um, like I just didn't do everything right. I don't know, It's prob I'm probably being too hard on myself, but I just think it's really important for the time and effort that goes into these things to really take our time to uh, check our gauge. And I know that might be annoying to some people. I think me, you know, a month ago or two months ago would have thought that was so annoying to hear, <laughs> but it's true. So anyway, I'm just, I'm gonna say that. So that is the one thing that I'm definitely going to be doing differently moving forward with my knitting projects. We'll talk more about that in just a second, but Overall, I am so happy with the way that this came out. I love the yarn. I love the fabric. I like how drapey it is. I feel like if you were to do this in like an even drapier yarn, it would just be lovely. I just, I just think it's really fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and come in a little closer so you can see the fabric and then I'm gonna show you some of the FO pictures that I took of this. Okay, so I'm gonna come closer so you can kind of see the fabric is really beautiful. You can see kind of the way it drapes. I don't know, it's not stiff by any means. It's really comfy and ugh, yeah, I love it. 
it's just, and it just hugs your shoulders. It's not too tight. So super excited about my Veronica cardigan. So here is a quick look at my FO photos. And something you should know about these photos is that my son using my remote shutter for my camera snapped every single one of these. I couldn't get my pictures to come out right with my hand holding the shutter. So he came in in the clutch and he helped me snap each of these pictures. So go ahead and check it out. My next finished object, this, I, it's crazy. I have two finished objects and they're both pretty substantial. So that makes me happy. My next finished object is my winter's fern hat by Trin and Nelly. I was working on this. I was about halfway through on the last episode of the podcast and I'm so excited to share this with you and have it be done. I would be wearing it, but between the sweater and, you know, not being super cold in the house, it would have made me super hot. So I will show photos of this as well, but I want to talk a little bit about this right now too. So this is my Winter's Fern by Trin Anelli, and it is beautiful. I love this so much. Like it gives me all the fall feels. It is like I mentioned on Instagram, the autumn hat to end all autumn hats. I mean, look at the colors, you guys loving this, absolutely loving this. So a couple of things that I did, um, one of them I did differently unintentionally and the other I did just because I wanted more contrast. So the first thing that I did was um, I cast it on with the main color and the pattern calls for you to cast on with a contrasting color, which for me would have been this orange color here so that you would have an initial cast on edge of a contrasting color. I kind of wish that I had done that, but I didn't even think about it and I didn't want to go back and cast on again only because it was a knit to pearl to cast on and that takes a little bit of time plus it didn't really bother me all that much so I just went with it and I still have some really fun like sporty racing stripes on the brim of the hat really pretty so that was the only one thing down here that I did unintentionally an intentional modification was I added a contrasting color. So the hat only calls for three colors to be worked, but I wanted something a little bit more punchy. And honestly, I feel like had I just stuck with the cream, the brown, and this um, kind of russet color, it wouldn't have been as satisfying. It would be beautiful, but it wouldn't have been as satisfying to number one knit and also just to look at. So this navy blue that you're seeing this is um, something I added to the pattern and just kind of added, I added it in places that I thought would look right. I didn't really think too much about it and I kind of just added it as I went, but I love the contrast it adds to the hat. So I'll pull in close, you can see. It just adds a really pretty punch, a pop of like a deep navy, um, you know, among these really warm colors, a nice cool pop of color there. I love it so much. Um, and I also loved it so much that I needed to make my pom-pom that navy color. So this hat, you guys, ugh, I just think, like I said, it screams autumn and fall. And it's going to be so much fun when the days get really cool and crisp. But when we're taking Angus out trick-or-treating um, to wear something like this to stay nice and warm, I really, really love it. So this is the Winter's Fern by Trin and Nelly. And you guys, I am not a veteran color work knitter by any means. This is my second, I would say this is my second color work piece. I had half of a color work hat started from a, a couple years ago, but this is my second full finished color work piece and I'm really excited about it. Here are my floats. I mean, they're not perfect. I don't really know what perfect looks like, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but I think they look pretty darn good considering, you know, how much of a novice I am when it comes to knitting color work. This hat, actually, I would recommend it if you're kind of new to color work knitting or if you're practicing your color work because you have your eyes on a really great sweater and you want to start with something small, which is exactly what I'm doing here. Um, definitely check this out. It's, it's really fun because you do get a nice intricate color work motif, but it's relatively simple to work. You're not, you know you're not struggling too much with the technique to get the really pretty results. So yeah, I definitely recommend this. I love it. And that's exactly why I'm doing this. I feel like 
Um, color work hats are a great place to start with color work to get a feel of doing it in the round. But this is just a really good place to start if you are learning. So I really love this. The Winter's Fern by Trin and Nelly. And instead of me just holding it up for you, here is a look at my FO photos. <music> My next FO that I want to share with you guys is simply a swatch. So if you watched the last episode of the podcast, you know that my next, um, kind of next in line in my queue after this was cast off is the Truss Cardigan by Melissa Whirl. That is coming down the pipe now. I actually have started it, but prior to starting, I did a, an official full on proper gauge swatch. So here's a look at the pattern so you can kind of see what I'm talking about when I talk about the truss cardigan. It's a really beautiful structured boxy cardigan that's seamed. It's knit in pieces and seamed. It's beautiful. I love the texture. I love the minimal design but with that nice interest of the ribbing going up the side. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to put the time and the investment in the yarn into this project and this is going to be the same for all garment knits that I do from here on out uh, and this is of course a we'll see how long that lasts type of situation but this is my goal. I wanted to take the time to swatch to make sure that it was going to come out to size when it was all finished just because I didn't want to have that feeling in my stomach thinking that it just wasn't going to come out to size especially because it's knit in pieces and I can't really try it on as I go so it was really important to me to do a proper gauge swatch. I was so proud of this that I took a photo on Instagram with my swatch all pinned down and my ruler and my little gauge swatch square. I'm so excited about about this. So this is my gauge swatch that is for, let me make sure, yeah, that is for my, nope, this is the right side. That is going to be for my truss cardigan. This is knit in Brooklyn Tweed Shelter, which is what the pattern calls for. This is the Long John's colorway. And I'm really excited about this cardigan in this color. Now it's beautiful in that gray color. And I know that had I, or if I were to knit it in something like gray, it would go with more items in my wardrobe. But this is my thinking. When it comes to red, I feel like if you can find the right red, it goes with almost anything. And so I love this red. It has a little bit more blue in it than that red that I'm talking about, that like tomato color that does go with everything. But it's such a pretty red. So I feel like this will go with so many things that I have in my wardrobe. Most of the things that I have in my wardrobe are neutrals or stripes or colors that um, tend to be a little bit more muted. This I think will go well with a lot of the things that I have in my wardrobe. So I'm super excited about that. So this is Shelter in the Long John's colorway. And this, you guys, is a four by four swatch. I'm so excited. I, um, I did a uh, proper number of stitches, the proper number of rows, and I bordered it with garter stitch to help it lay flat. I wet blocked this and um, you know I pinned it down. Now, one of the things that I mentioned on Instagram when it comes to how I did the blocking for this, I, I kind of asked a question and clarified what I had done. So I knew before I blocked it that it was pretty much spot on. And I did this with the intended needle size, which is like a huge score for me. So it was pretty much spot on prior to blocking, but I knew that there was just that, just that tiny bit of space that blocking should take care of. So I feel like blocking is always a huge consideration when you're doing a gauge swatch because blocking is not going to shrink your swatch. If anything, it's going to cause it to grow just, just a little bit. Um, so what I did was after I wet it and um, put it onto my mat to pin down, I didn't stretch it as much as I kind of shaped it into a square. It was already matching up four inches by four inches. I didn't really have to stretch it to gauge, but sometimes you read in directions where it says block to the dimensions in the schematic. And it kind of begs the question like, how much are we blocking to the dimensions? Like, are we expected to just stretch it to those dimensions? And I know the answer is no, because if you're obviously knitting something that's coming out much smaller than the gauge that's, you know, intended in the pattern, it wouldn't be wise to stretch that to dimensions. That would just ruin your fabric. But 
how much stretching is acceptable. And I don't even think really stretching is the right word. I think it's more shaping. So I just, you know, laid it out and you can see just with the way that I'm holding it, it's not puckering or trying to curl or anything like this is pretty much the way it knit up just nice and evened out um, and blocked. And so that was kind of my question is like, how much shaping is appropriate? What does it mean to, you know, block it to the dimensions in the schematic. I'm, and, and please, like if you have any tips or advice in this regard, please let me know in the bottom I or in the comments down below. I'm always looking for more, you know, advice on this because I think the reason I've avoided gauge swatching in the past was because it was always just kind of a mystery to me. And I know that there's those of you out there that are veteran knitters that are like, why is this a mystery? This is common sense. You knit a gauge swatch, you see if it matches. Like I, I get that. But I felt like I just never, I think it was laziness. Honestly, I think I just didn't want to understand it because I really didn't want to have to do it. But now that I've done it and I have a nice little you know, gauge swatch here that I can look at for reference, I can feel the fabric, I can feel the drape, I feel like I get it. And so those of you out there that are reluctant to knit a complete gauge swatch and block it, or when you read in a pattern the gauge and it tells you in parentheses blocked and you cringe, just embrace it. Just give it a shot. It makes you feel like a big grown-up knitter. <laughs> and I felt like that's exactly what I did is I pulled up my big girl panties and I just knit a gauge swatch. So I recommend it if you have yet to do that. So before I completely just yank this thing around. Oh, so that is my final finished object for this episode of the podcast is a completed little gauge swatch. <laughs> Okay, so I have two works of progress that I want to share with you guys today. Now, I have mentioned before, um, just recently and then on the previous episode of the podcast, that I am following my cue. Um, my Ravelry notebook has been kind of revamped. My projects are in there. They're up to date. My cue is up to date. My favorites are up to date and categorized. Everything is there. And so I have now created a five item queue. So there's only five items in there at any given time or less, um, depending on whether or not I've figured out all five of the items that I want to do in my queue. Right now, I believe there's only two because I've cast it on to two of the items and I've removed one of the items. So what I'm going to share with you now is what was next in my queue once I cast off the Winter's Fern and the Veronica cardigan. The Mira hat was next in my queue for small projects to be working on. And and Mira is a pattern by Amy Christophers for Barocco. It's a really beautiful color work hat. And you can see here that the yarn that's used to knit this, I believe it's called Abode by Barocco. It's kind of a marled, I don't even know if that's the right word, but it's um it's it's almost like heathered. The yarn is not a full solid. Each of the colors that are used kind of have like a heathered or a marled look to them. So the color work pattern has very soft um, kind of edges to it, which I think is lovely. But I definitely wanted to see more crisp definition in the color work design on my version of the hat. I am knitting this in all, actually all but one, um, Fiber for the People yarn, which is my hand dyed yarn. This is on the O Merino worsted base. This this is 100% non superwash merino worsted weight yarn. I love working with this yarn. I've raved about this yarn in the past. It is just a great all around soft next to skin wearing worsted weight yarn. And I really love the color choice. So I'm super excited to share this with you. So this is my third color work hat in the last two and a half months, I think not even that. Um, so here it is. This is the Mira by Amy Christophers in Fiber for the People yarn. Okay, so the only yarn here that's not Fiber for the People is the natural color that you're seeing. I have a bunch of um, LB, the LB collection by Lion Brand in their natural single ply weight yarn. It's it's kind of an Aran worsted weight yarn. Um, more Aran than worsted really, but I have so much of it in my stash. I've thought about dyeing it and using it for a garment, but I kind of like having some natural yarn in my stash for this purpose. So that is actually what is the lighter color. 
but the other three colors are fiber for the people. So we have Mama's Lipstick, which is actually going to be in the shop in the next update. It was actually in the previous update as well. Um, then I have Piglet, which is being changed to Sugar Pie. I'm changing the name to Sugar Pie because I just really don't like the image of Piglet for a colorway. And then I have my English Toffee colorway, which is this really beautiful toffee colorway that you see happening on the top. So those are the colors in my Mira and I really, really love this design so far. I love the motif and I really love the way these colors play together. So English Toffee, um, LB Collection Natural, Piglet or Sugar Pie and Mama's Lipstick. Ugh, so pretty, so pretty together. Can't wait to make some more progress on this. Here are my floats. I think floats are a really fun way to see the colors together because you see more, they're more frequent um, and kind of spread all out over the project as opposed to such a stark contrast in the colors. So it's kind of a really cool way to see them come together. Loving this. Um, a couple of things that I did differently. So I did make some modifications to this. I really have been embracing a Ravelry as a way to kind of learn how something's going to fit because you get to see a variety of different body shapes wearing that particular item um, or just a variety of different heads wearing that particular hat and you get to see how the hat fits on them based on the yarn and the gauge that they got and the size that they're knitting and so on and so forth. So I'm really embracing that right now. One of the things I noticed when I was looking at other people wearing this hat was that most people, it seemed to fit them more snug as if the hat was just smaller and it only had one size. So this pattern only has a, oh, it's a single size hat. And I really don't like hats to fit like beanies. I think the only hat that I have in my, you know, hat wardrobe that I like that fits more like a beanie is the Fedra hat by Gudrun Johnston. There's something about the thick, bulky yarn and that really pretty cable texture that kind of makes it, I guess, more enjoyable to wear and more textured and pretty, I think, on me, considering I have really short hair. Typically, I like my hats to be kind of more slouchy, um, a little bit on the larger side with a little bit more ease. And so I was reading um, a few other people's pattern notes on how they kind of made adjustments and one of them, um, instead of casting on 88 stitches, cast it on 96 stitches um, and then increased to 108 stitches at the increase portion. That's exactly what I did. And then I also used one size larger of needle. So the pattern calls for a, a Broco Abode, which is a an Aran weight yarn. Now, Aran weight yarn is slightly heavier than a typical worsted weight yarn. And so knowing that and also knowing how I wanted this to fit, I decided to not only up the stitch count, but then also to up the needle size as well. So I'm using a size larger needle than what's called for in the pattern. And I'm really loving the way that it's working up. The brim is nice and stretchy, but not um, overly so. You get kind of a nice stretchy brim that's gonna be comfortable on my head. It's not going to be too tight. And I like that. You can see it's nice and stretchy here, but it's also really nice and squishy. The fabric is really squishy. I just love the way this yarn works up, especially in ribbing. Ugh, it's so pretty. And then the main fabric is coming together quite nicely. I know a lot of people say that your color work is always going to knit to a tighter gauge than everything else, but I haven't really noticed that too much but I haven't knit much color work, so talk to me in a year, I guess. <laughs> but I haven't noticed it be too much tighter, um, but I do like the way that this needle size and the yarn weight is working together in the color work motif. I think it's coming out nice and clear. Um, there's, yeah, I just, I don't know, I really like it. I, th I think it's working up really nicely and the brim fits around my head and the rest of what I have knit on the hat kind of is, you can tell it's gonna drape nicely. So super excited about this. This is the Mira by Amy Christopher's. Definitely recommend it um, so far because I think the color work is super intuitive. You do have to carry your floats every once in a while or catch your floats every once in a while, but that's not very difficult to do. So I, you know, I just, I really love it. Um, the only thing that I've done here that I think is kind of a no-no and I'll turn the hat inside out to talk about this a little bit. So the pattern calls for, so certain colors in the pattern are used 
in certain places and then not used for quite a while and then used again. I really don't like carrying yarn up this, like carrying several strands of yarn up the side. So what I did was um, after I used, for example, this uh, pink color that you see happening here, after I used this in this section, knowing I wasn't gonna use it again for a good inch and a half to two inches, I just broke the yarn and figured I would weave in the end. I'd rather do that than have to struggle wrapping, you know, one, two, three, four strands of yarn together. I don't know, I know that that can be kind of a no-no, but I just did it anyway, because I figured it's not gonna hurt the knitting and it just means that I weave the ends in later, no big deal. I'm gonna have to weave in a ton of ends anyway, so <laughs> why, what's, what's two more in the grand scheme of things? So that's the only other thing that I did that might be I don't know. Is that a no-no? Are you not supposed to do that? I really don't know. I just think it made sense for me. But now this is living in my gray fringe field bag, which is pretty cool because I have all of the balls of yarn in the bag. Um, and I'm using, and the reason why I love this so much is you can use these field bags for color work because they have grommets inside for you to run your strands of yarn through. So it kind of keeps your yarn organized and yeah, that's great. Plus I love a good fringe field bag and it's working out really well for this project. Anyway, loving this, the mirror hat by Amy Christopher's. If you need a color work hat, definitely check it out because it is super satisfying. My next work in progress is my Trust Cardigan by Melissa Whirl. This is a pattern for Brooklyn Tweed. We've talked about it previously on this episode, but I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about it because I learned a new technique and I'm super excited to share it with you, but also because I wanna show you this new ceramic yarn bowl that I have that I'm holding the cake of yarn in right now. So this is my ceramic llama yarn pole that is so adorable. I got this on Etsy. It is from Barantondo Ceramics. They're out of Avila, Spain. I think they're make to order. I'm not exactly sure, but they're all hand crafted and hand shaped into these beautiful little ceramic yarn bowls and they're a really perfect size because they're big enough for a pretty substantial cake of yarn. I find that I have chapstick in here, which is jingling around. I find that typical yarn bowls are number one, too shallow and number two, too small for a cake of yarn. And also too, they have a bowl shape. So they're, they have a rounded bottom and a cake of yarn doesn't have a rounded bottom. It has almost, you know, edges. Um, it's a cylinder pretty much when you cake yarn. And I feel like the cylindrical shape of the inside of this yarn bowl really helps to kind of store a cylindrical cake of yarn um, nicely and securely. It doesn't come bouncing out of here. It has the little catches um, for your yarn here, or if you're doing color work, you have a spot here. Now, the only thing about the color work is, um, you know, you would have to be able to fit three cakes of yarn in here, and I don't know how possible that is, but it's still really cute. So this is by Barantondo on Etsy. They're a ceramic company on Etsy, and this is what their logo looks like. It's just a B and three R's, like brr or but I don't even know. <laughs> I'm not gonna even try. Maybe when you um, say their name in uh, accented properly, you roll the R, which I don't know how to do, but. So anyway, love that. I did wanna save it for the acquisition segment just because I wanted to show it to you with my work in progress, but definitely, definitely love this. The work in progress that I have is, like I said, my trust cardigan. Now I am actually in the process of doing my first row of ribbing for the back of the cardigan after doing my tubular cast on. Okay, so I in the past have really not liked working a tubular cast on and that's because the methods that I've used for a tubular cast on require you to do a special actual cast on. So you, you don't, when you do a, a long tail cast on, you hold the yarn in a certain way and you weave your needle through the yarn to create your stitches on the needle. When, when you do a tubular cast on, it's different. There's like a whole different way to weave your stitches onto the needle. And then you have to do your foundation rows, which are really frustrating because um, number one, you have to do it on straight needles. So if you're using circular needles, you need to switch to straight needles. Otherwise your stitches get all confused on the cord of a circular needle. So that's one thing. Um, but then the other thing is that your stitches get all confused on the needle. So you have this interesting way of casting on the stitches by weaving your needle in and out of the yarn that puts stitches on your needle that get twisted and turned and you have to really keep track. 
and I tend to lose count when I do this. If you've done a tubular cast on, you may be familiar with what I'm talking about. It's just kind of frustrating. So when I saw that I needed to do a tubular cast on for this, I wasn't going to not do it because I wanted to follow the pattern. I wanted to do what was called for because that was what was gonna produce the garment I was seeing that I was interested in. And also too, for as much as I don't like tubular cast ons, um, or at least doing a tubular cast on, I really love the beautiful edge that it creates. I think it's worth the time, honestly. But anyway, so I saw that that was coming up in the pattern and I was thinking like, oh, I don't wanna have to do this. And you have to do it three times because you do it for the back and then you do it for the right front and the left front. But I noticed that it was saying, do a tubular cast on with waist yarn. And that was new to me. I'd never done a provisional tubular cast on before. I've done provisional cast ons, but I've never done a provisional tubular cast on with waist yarn. So as soon as I realized that that was what I was gonna have to do, I just Googled how to do a tubular cast on with waist yarn. And I found a couple of really good tutorials. But the one thing that I did find was a tutorial for doing a crochet provisional cast on, which is typically recommended when you're doing a provisional tubular cast on. So the Crochet um, Provisional Cast On was a tutorial by Isolde Teague. I'll go ahead and link to it down below in the description box, but it's an excellent tutorial. But it made me realize how beautiful and easy a crocheted provisional cast on is. So if you're looking for a provisional cast on that gives you a really nice clean edge, definitely check out the link that I provide down below. So I did my crochet provisional cast on and then I went to the back of the pattern for the truss cardigan and it walks you through how to do the foundation rows for your tubular cast on. And what's great about this is that other than you uh, having to do the crochet provisional cast on or just any provisional cast on, all you're doing at that point is four additional rows of ribbing. There's no wacky cast on, there's no stitches getting twisted around. It's pretty much cast on the required number of stitches and then do the four foundational rows and you're all good to go and it's super simple. So if you have a pattern that's requiring a tubular cast on, definitely try doing it with waist yarn with a crochet provisional cast on because it really gives you a really nice clean result. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what I have so far. Now I just casted this on this morning actually, um, so I obviously don't have have much but I just did my gauge swatch so that took up some time too but that's very important okay so here is what I have so this is I'm gonna scoot forward here so this is my so the just the very beginning I've only worked the first row of knit one pearl one here but you can see my provisional cast on happening here um, in the blue contrasting yarn yeah so I really really love this super easy next I, I won't you know, shy away from a tubular cast on from now on, I'll just use this method. Cause the reason I didn't like the tubular cast on was just the quirky way that the stitches get twisted and um, having to use a straight needle. I don't like having to get a separate needle. You already need however many needles you need for the pattern plus a straight needle. Like that's just too many needles for me. So I like not having to do that with this. The only thing that you might need extra if you're doing the crochet provisional cast on, which you don't have to do, is a crochet hook. But um, yeah, it's super simple. And they also mention in the pattern, which was really good to know, you can remove your provisional cast on at any point after you've done your foundation rows, but that they recommend you leave it until after blocking because it keeps your tubular cast on stitches nice and tidy and keeps them from stretching out in the knitting and blocking process. And I thought that was really, really clever to kind of know and I'm definitely gonna be doing that. So I'm not going to remove my provisional cast on until the whole sweater is blocked. So that way I know I'm not over stretching um, this particular portion of the garment. So yeah, really, really love this. So the ribbing, I have to um, do the ribbing for the back and each of the front panels. And then once those are done, I'll pick up the stitches that I need for the body of the cardigan and then it'll be knit in one piece at that point. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I just have to do kind of like the not so fun knitting of str strips of ribbing essentially before I can you know pick up the stitches and start the real work I guess um, but at least I'll get practice with that tubular cast on method which I'm super excited about that so that is what I have of my truss cardigan and it's coming along like I said this is the back portion and I am actually knitting this with my Lika needles 
So these are my Lika needles, and I have talked about these before. They're Norwegian driftwood knitting needles. That's kind of how they're marketed. I've mentioned these before not being my favorite, primarily because of the cord. The cord's just not very flexible, but because I'm just knitting the ribbing and because this is a sweater that will take up most of the length of the cord, it doesn't really bother me too much. I'm not using it for a magic loop or anything like that. But the needle tips themselves, the really smooth wood finish on these I feel like is perfectly suited for Brooklyn Tweed woolen spun yarn just because it doesn't I don't know it doesn't stab the yarn like my Chiagu's or the Haya Haya's can it just kind of moves into the stitches without being too stabby or pokey so I'm definitely enjoying the Licka needles with the Brooklyn Tweed yarn but that's my trust cardigan so far, and I'm looking forward to getting more done to share with you on the next episode of the podcast. So I'm really excited to share with you my most recent acquisition. It's a path I've been wanting to go down, an itch I've been wanting to scratch for a little while now since I have been dyeing yarn. As you know, I dye yarn for Fiber for the People. That's my hand dyed yarn business. This is an avenue of yarn dyeing that I definitely have been wanting to look into more. And there's more information coming on this, but I just wanted to share this with you guys today because I'm super excited about it. There are definitely going to be some vlogs chronicling my journey in this. Um, so without further ado, let me go ahead and share with you what I have just recently acquired. Okay, so this is a book called The Modern Natural Dyer, and it's by Christine Vehar, and it's a really excellent resource on how to dye yarn naturally using whole dye stuffs, using extracts, um, various different ways that you can do it, various different um, materials that you can dye. This is primarily focused on wool, linen, and cotton. And um, I obviously am focusing primarily on the wool aspect of this, but this is all about dyeing yarn naturally. So I, like I said, I've been thinking about doing a natural dyeing for quite some time, at least learning about natural dyeing and giving it a shot. Um, I think in the past I may have said that I wasn't going to go down this route just because I was overwhelmed with everything of the business starting and growing and all of that. But now that I've developed, I realized that I would really like to try some other techniques for dyeing yarn or perhaps potentially creating a naturally dyed collection of yarn for fiber for the people. So that is something that I'm thinking about. It's all in the works right now. It's really, really exciting. Um, but in the meantime, I'm learning. I'm taking my time to learn um, about the process, to learn what I have available to me in regards to dye stuffs, all of that um, that's, you know, talked about here and then other resources as well. I'm, I'm in the learning phases right now, which is exciting um, for here at the Wool Needles Hands, a fiber journey channel, because I definitely want to chronicle that learning process with you guys. So as I learn about natural um, dyes and naturally dyeing yarn, I'm going to be sharing that with you guys in vlog series. And hopefully... Um, per maybe, we'll see, include this as a collection for Fiber for the People yarn. So we're gonna go ahead and see. I've been planting a lot of flowers lately because it's, I know this is a strange time to plant flowers, but for where we live, it's actually a really great time. Um, this time of year is almost like a second spring because the temperature cools down um, and it becomes livable again for certain types of plants. And so I've been planting flowers in the backyard and lots of marigolds. I've really been planting lots of marigolds because they're so beautiful and they smell really, really nice. And that means I'm having uh, lots of dried marigold buds that are falling down into the pots. And that's normal. That's just, they, they bloom and then they dry and then they fall into the pot. And I just recently started going around the backyard with my son collecting some dried marigold buds. So that's what I have here is a little jar of some dried marigold buds. I don't have a lot in here right now, um, just because the marigolds that we have in the backyard are pretty fresh. There's lots of fresh blooms on there, so we will have lots more. But I figured marigold would be a really great first place to start with natural dyeing. So I'm gonna create a collection of those and then go from there. But I'm super, super excited about this. There's so much to this um, that I didn't realize. I know a couple of natural dyers out there. Um, Blue Sheep Yarn Co. is one of them. She actually has her own um, dyer's garden where she grows and harvests all of her dye stuffs there at her home and I think that is incredible. 
But I have a lot of respect for those who die naturally because the process, unless of course you're buying extracts, um, which simplifies the process, the process is very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very rigorous process and time consuming. I mean, just take a look at this photograph of, you know, whole dye stuffs in this collection. Like, it's beautiful, but you can only imagine how much collecting you have to do to have enough to produce, to sell. I mean, and there's lots of natural dyers out there that are selling their yarn. It's really beautiful. I'm also really inspired. I've um, become more familiar lately with the yarn shop in Berkeley, California called A Verb for Keeping Warm. I follow Karen Templer on Instagram and Fringe Association and Fringe Supply Co. And she talks a lot about this particular yarn shop because this was her local yarn shop when she was living in Berkeley. And so I've, I've done some research about them and I've learned a little bit about their background. And one of the things that they have there is a natural dye studio and it's beautiful. And it looks like that photo. There's, you know, the dried plants and there's all of the different jars full of various different dye materials. And it's really inspiring. And so I think that kind of, cause that itch I was mentioning that needed to be scratched to kind of, you know, rear its head again. And so I wanted to embrace that and follow that inspiration and see where it led me. So I'm super excited to learn more about this and to continue to develop that craft. Um, I love dyeing yarn. I love the process of coming up with the different colorways and all the techniques and the color. I just love it so much. Um, and I know that that passion is only growing and it's growing with the business, which is a beautiful thing. So I'm hoping that this could potentially be another avenue that I take my business down. So we'll see um, if it is. It's just going to be a facet of fiber for the people. I'm not changing the whole company into a natural dyed yarn company by any means. I just figured why not try something and perhaps make a naturally dyed yarn collection for the shop. So we'll see. But join me on that journey. Keep posted in this space uh, for more vlogs that are coming on naturally dyeing yarn. I look forward to doing that with you guys. Um, but I wanted to share that with you because it's kind of a new inspiring you know way that I'm taking my craft all right guys if you have been watching the podcast for the last few episodes you know that we are doing a wool needles hands book along or a podcast book club for the book three bags full by Leonie Swan that is going on right now over in Ravelry in the chatter thread for the book along we have um, a guidelines thread where I share with you what's you know going on with this particular book along and then each uh, section of reading we do six chapters every two weeks has their own chatter threads as well so definitely head over and check that out I wanted to make a quick announcement and kind of an amendment for how I was going to do this. I don't think that I am going to make a separate segment on the podcast where I chat about my reading. And the reason is because I know not everybody is participating in the book along. And I really, you know, producing the podcast is time consuming all in itself. And I don't want to produce a segment of the podcast that's only going to be viewed and kind of relatable to a small group of viewers. I hope that makes sense and I hope you understand that, but it's just helps me streamline things because I love sitting down and producing this podcast, um, but it is but it is a time consuming process. And so I just feel like that portion of the podcast as a segment on the podcast is unnecessary. I'm going to be participating in the chatter threads for each of the readings um, every two weeks with you guys. So if you would like to join in the conversation, head over to Ravelry. We'll consider this an online, you know, Ravelry slash podcast book along, but we're going to keep the conversation and everything about this book along on Ravelry. So it's a really kind of, it's really just an online book club, if you will. So if you want to share um, in this reading with us and have, you know, like-minded people in this knitting community reading the same book and chatting about it, head over to Ravelry. You can go ahead and pick up where we are right now. We've just read the first six chapters of the book and we're chatting about that over on Ravelry. If you'd like, you can read the first 12 chapters of the book and meet back in two weeks from now and catch up to where we are there. So that's kind of what I'm going to do going forward with the book along. If, um, if things change and we get this huge influx of people that want to participate, maybe I'll make it a segment. But right now, because there's just a small number of us doing it, I'm just going to keep it um, on the Ravelry group. So hopefully you understand. Um, it makes sense to me. I'm sure it makes sense to you guys, but I just wanted to let you know here. <music> Thank you.
All right, guys, this segment of the podcast is where I showcase some of your local yarn shops. So these shops are submitted to the podcast by viewers. They go out into the shop, take photos or videos, send them to me, and I patch them together here in a little montage to share with you some of the local yarn shops that are out there in this community. I have had yarn shops come from other parts of the world. I have some come from other parts of the United States. It's really all over the place. So if you would like to participate in the local yarn store call to action, please do so. Head out into your community to your local yarn shop take some video take some photos talk to the owners the managers of the shop get some information about the shop let them know what you're going to be doing with the footage so that they can check it out themselves and send it to me here so that I can continue to do my part to broaden our perspective of the local yarn communities in all of our areas. This local yarn shop was submitted by Anne Gigi, who is at Pine Lake Chic on Ravelry and Instagram. This is the Nifty Knitter in Issaquah, Washington. <laughs> Right, guys that is all the time I have for today thank you so much for checking out episode 34 of the podcast spending your time with me to listen to me chat about these things that I love so much it means so much to me to see you come back time and time again every time I upload something here on the channel so thank you thank you so much this wouldn't be a thing if it weren't for you guys I appreciate it more than you could possibly know I look forward to talking to you guys on the next episode of the podcast don't forget to check out the fiber for the people shop update on Saturday October 27th until then, you guys, happy knitting, happy whatever it is that you're doing. I will talk to you again soon. <laughs>